Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Nearly five years ago, Chairman Bishop began the task of developing this bill. Along the way, he and his staff have conducted hundreds of meetings all over Utah. It is a worthy effort to develop a comprehensive blueprint for 18 million acres of land, roughly the size of Massachusetts and New Jersey combined, that are clearly so deeply cherished by all who live there. But this endeavor does not ultimately fulfill its potential of reaching a bipartisan solution. Our nation's public lands protect some of the places that have shaped and defined who we are as a people and a country, and would not have been protected without support from the federal government. While necessarily resident in a particular state, states do not have the right to unilaterally set policy on these lands that belong to all Americans. Though state lands are often managed to maximize profitability, our nation's public lands are managed for a wide range of activities and on behalf of all Americans. As stewards of these lands, we must work to find a balance between compelling yet sometimes competing interests and make sure that the federal government is a good neighbor to local communities. Unfortunately, instead of looking for bipartisan policy solutions to protected treasured natural resources and wild areas, promote recreation, and support responsible economic development, the legislation before us today fails to strike the appropriate balance between these priorities. In fact, a closer examination of the so-called conservation provisions demonstrates a clear pattern of loopholes, rollback protections, and an undermining of federal land management authority, all of which threaten the long-term conservation value of these areas. It could be said that this is a wolf in sheep's clothing. For example, Title I of the legislation purports to designate over 1.6 million acres of wilderness but contradicts the Wilderness Act by indefinitely allowing motorized vehicle use and construction of new water infrastructure. This is a violation of the Wilderness Act's promise to preserve certain federal lands, quote, for the use and enjoyment of the American people in such manner as will leave them unimpaired for future use and enjoyment as wilderness, unquote. The National Conservation Areas and Special Management Areas in Titles 2 and 4 have loopholes that allow for thousands of miles of off-road vehicle routes, mining, drilling, deforestation projects, and livestock grazing, activities that are inherently inconsistent with a federal land manager's duty to protect the natural, cultural, educational, and scientific resources. The National Conservation Area that is intended to protect Bears Ears, a Native American ancestral homeland, would allow motorized recreation, grazing in areas where it is currently prohibited, and block federal agencies from protecting the wilderness quality of hundreds of thousands of acres of land. This puts the region's many Native American cultural and archaeological sites at risk of permanent destruction. The watershed management areas created under Section 3 claim to protect water quality, but the bill also requires mandatory levels of grazing and snowmobile access, authorizes the construction of permanent roads, sets new requirements for water use, and allows for timber operations, severely limiting federal land managers' ability to best protect precious water resources. Even conservation designations that are more familiar to average Americans, such as national parks, national monuments, and wild and scenic rivers, are not exempt from harmful policies in this legislation. Sections of this bill related to these special areas are also ridden with loopholes that loosen rules for logging, allow motorized vehicle use, prohibit protections for air quality, and allow commercial activities without full and careful consideration of the impacts to natural resources, once again undermining their long-term conservation value to the American public. All told, despite the many years of effort, this is not a legislative proposal that has a realistic chance of being passed by the Senate or signed into law by President Obama. Last month, Grand County in eastern Utah sent a letter to the Utah de delegation expressing their opposition to the proposal, detailing nine significant departures from the recommendations they developed with the input of their stakeholders, partners, and citizens. The Salt Lake Le the Salt Lake Tribune wrote in an editorial that, quote, a, nation, a negotiated settlement would have been better, but a Bears, Bears Ears Monument Declaration looks like the only viable solution at this point. 
And perhaps most significantly, last week, Governor Gary Herbert, a Republican, announced in a press conference that he may soon bring forth his own proposal to the Obama administration regarding the long-term protection of the Bears Ears region, further indication that the legislation before us today has little chance of successfully becoming law. I'd like to thank all of the witnesses for their participation, many of whom have traveled across the country to be with us today, and I look forward to your testimony. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's clear today that, uh, and we're hearing it over and over again, and much, much appreciation has been given to the, to the uh, many hearings that were held and the, the strong effort that has been made to bring people together, but clear that we still have real differences uh, that are getting in our way. Uh, and one aspect of this bill that has received a lot of attention, and we're certainly hearing it today with our questions, is the effort to protect the area known as Bears Ears. So, Ms. White Skunk, can you tell us why this place is so special and worthy of protection? This location is worthy of protection for many reasons, but up most is the Native American have ties, and it's just not the five tribes. Many tribes have come and gone through this area. We have ties and identity to the, to the earth. It's who we are, what we do, where we pray, where our ancestors once roamed. There's still strong evidence that, that they were there. When they're there, we're still there. Our prayers and, and our, our viability on a daily basis is still very, very much in existence. It's our responsibility to protect once was for what is upcoming in the future for our children, our grandchildren. Uh, we have to protect the water usage. We have to protect the vegetation, the fragile ecosystem that, that fringes in the balance of, of, of what is called civilization. Uh, from what I last heard, the greatest thing that ever happened to us was when uh, the Homestead Act came to be. I didn't, I, my last understanding was there were native people that did live in those areas. I didn't know it needed to be homesteaded. So we, we have a natural innate desire to take care of what is, and that's been in our DNA. And one of the goals, it. obviously, of this federal land subcommittee and the Natural Resources Committee is to identify places that have deep significance both to the peoples who live and have lived in those regions, but also for what they say about who we are as a country. So given your deep uh, connection to uh, Bears Ears, was the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition able to participate in the PLI negotiations? We started out, and let me back up a little bit, with the, with the group of the Utah Diné Bikea, they initially were the grassroots organization that started that discussion. It's through their, their frustrations and efforts that they then approached many of the tribes to collectively gain the support of tribal sovereign voices. And through that effort, that's how we organized as tribally elected leaders to bring the sovereign voices to the forefront so that we could conduct a government-to-government -government relationship and conversation. And did, were you all able to travel to Washington to make the case or, or, or on, uh, with any frequency? Well, what we, what we have in my um, exhibits that are, you'll also have, you have before you with my tes written testimony is uh, a demonstration of documented meetings and um, times of when we, we did participate and we have attempted to, to try to continue the conversations with um, Chairman Bishop and Chaffetz and um, through several of those meetings, it, we just didn't feel like we were quite taken seriously. So why then is, uh, can you sort of talk a little bit more about why you chose to left, leave the negotiations? Well, as I mentioned in, in the Exhibit A, our proposal, we've, we've provided a proposal in the exhibit. One of that proposal is an extensive timeline. Within that timeline, we just felt like it was just time that we needed to be taken seriously. On December 31st, we all gathered in White Mesa and we're supposed to have had a meeting with, with staff members and um, that morning we received a letter that that wasn't going to happen. We had blown our agenda out and we said we need to discuss what our next steps are and that's when it was discussed to great lengths that we would 
turn away from the PLI effort at that point because of frustrations. And were you able to raise your concerns with our chairman and their staff as they were engaging in this process? We did, and we asked for a reaction to our proposal. Um, subsidence reaction was never received. And do you feel that the PLI, as proposed, provides adequate protection for the, for the cultural resources of Bears Ears? We need collaborative management. We need more than an advisory position. And so you, you see much work that still needs to be done? Yes. Thank you, and I yield back. 